how did Bernie Madoff manage to swindle billions from the richest and most powerful people on Wall Street? We are talking about the biggest pyramid scheme of all time. A story that has all the ingredients of a novel or a good screenplay. Luxury, money, wealth, rags to riches, a lot of secret dealings, and a sudden fall into the abyss when the House of Cards collapsed with the outbreak of the financial crisis of 2008. So, the protagonist of this particular story is Bernie Lawrence Madoff. Bernie, to his friends. Madoff was a well-known American financier who managed to gain the trust of the most reputable investors, funds, and investment banks on Wall Street. Madoff had the financial elite in his pocket. Couldn't be better said, but also people as rich and prominent as Steven Spielberg, Kevin Bacon, Pedro Almodovar, or Alicia Koplovich, among many others. For almost two decades, he even managed to completely bypass the powerful US stock market regulators without them ever having the slightest suspicion. I remember that we are not talking about a minor matter. It is estimated that the pyramid model set up by Bernie Madoff ended up volatizing more than $65 billion from the accounts of his clients. Just try to process that figure. Yes. Yes, your ears don't deceive you, 65 billion with a B. It was perhaps the biggest Wall Street scam ever. And of course, the story did not end well. After the whole operation was uncovered, Madoff was arrested at the end of 2008 on 11th of December. Just a year later, in 2009, he was sentenced to 150 years in prison. He died in prison on the 14th of April, 2021. Swindler Bernie Madoff, creator of the biggest Ponzi scheme in history, dies in prison. Now, how could this character set up a whole pyramid structure in the very heart of Wall Street? How far did the implications of this gigantic scam reach? In this video that we've made, along with our friends from Value School, we tell you all the details. The Pyramid That Collapsed after the scandal was uncovered, victims began to emerge from all sides. The main victims were the Fairfield Century Fund Limited, which had $7.3 billion in Madoff's account, and the Kingate Global Fund Limited with $2.8 billion. The earthquake was, plain and simple, huge, both inside and outside the United States. The major firms operated with Madoff, American banks and foreign banks as important as Credit Agricole, BNP Paribas, Nomura, and HSBC, which held positions for almost $1.5 billion. In a single country such as Spain, the commission that regulates the securities market estimated that the Madoff scheme could have caused losses of up to 3 billion euros. This was largely due to the fact that the Santander Group managed more than 2.3 billion euros linked to Madoff's products through the Optimal Fund, a hedge fund domiciled in Switzerland, an operation that had multi-billion dollar repercussions. 18th of March 2019, Santander customers swindled by Bernard Madoff get their money back this Monday. Santander decided in 2009 to restore the principal invested to private banking clients affected by the scam, resulting in 1.38 billion euros. Huge Spanish fortunes such as Porcelain King, Jose Ladro, and transportation dynasty the Fernandez Somoza family, among others, signed up to the fund. In fact, Spain was the second hardest hit country by the scam after the United States. Of course, there are always those who lose more and those who lose less. According to the Wall Street Journal, Carl Shapiro, once known as the Cotton King of New York City and a friend of Madoff's for 50 years, may have been the individual who suffered the most losses, as much as $545 million. Of course, others also accused him of making a fortune over the years thanks to the income received from the contributions made by new clients. Anyway, However it happened, the question on our minds is, how on earth did the system really work? Well, you see, through his investment firm, which operated as a real financial group with its own investment advisory and even its own broker, Madoff's operations followed the classic pyramid scheme. That is, he promised great returns to his clients, but they were not paid out from the return on the investments, which in reality were mostly fictitious, but with the funds contributed by new clients, a textbook Ponzi scheme. Bernie Madoff had set up a business that was not really a business at all. The profits he brought to his clients, with returns ranging from 8% to 12%, regardless of what was happening in the stock market, did not come from real operations, but from the contributions of new clients. In other words, the income from the new customers was used to pay the yields of the old ones, a system that, in order to work successfully, required two absolutely necessary conditions. 
Now, let me explain. The first essential factor was to get a constant stream of new clients coming in with more and more fresh money. Something that, prior to the bursting of the real estate bubble and the subsequent financial crisis, was not that difficult to achieve. You know, these were the financial years of economic and financial bonanza. Money flowed happily, and many investors and citizens risked their wealth without too much fear. In short, there were plenty of clients. The second condition was that not all clients could request to withdraw their funds at the same time. Because if they did, the pyramid would quickly collapse and the jig would be up. But of course, with returns as high as those promised by Madoff, who would want to withdraw their money from such a golden goose? The collapse and bankruptcy of the Lehman Brothers, however, changed everything. Suddenly, fear gripped the market, and investors either needed their funds back or were scrabbling to put their money somewhere safe. And at that very moment, after receiving requests for refunds from his clients for more than $7 billion that he did not have, he admitted to his children and some of his employees the double business that he'd been doing for years. And then, absolutely unable to meet all the commitments, Madoff was forced to declare bankruptcy. The chaos, surprise, and stupefaction was almost universal. But how was he able to build a pyramid of almost 65 billion US dollars without anyone, investors, regulators, or the media noticing anything unusual? Well, in order to answer that question, we have to start the story at the very, very beginning. The Promise of Constant Profitability Bernie Madoff was a well-respected figure in New York and a highly regarded in financial circles from the time that he started his investment company, Madoff Investment Securities, in the 1960s, after failing to complete his law studies. A company that, by the way, he started with only $5,000 that he managed to accumulate working as a lifeguard and sprinkler installer. In the beginning, he worked with penny stocks, that is, low-value shares. If you've ever seen The Wolf of Wall Street, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. The fact is that his activity was escalating, and with it, his fame and his position. This makes sense because at the beginning, things went smoothly and at full sale. Thanks to the contacts that he forged over time and his management style, he was able to manage the money of large fortunes and large companies. We might even say that for many years, having your money under the management of Bernie Madoff was a source of prestige. His usual mode of operation was known as split strike conversions, a method that uses an index of options. The operation is broadly as follows. A manager buys the shares of an index through options that are also listed and thereafter buys and sells these options against the shares of the same index. However, in view of his enormous success, as he himself acknowledged, Madoff stopped trading actual stocks in the 1990s and switched to pretending to do so. Then, he would introduce fake securities in his clients' portfolios, and from there, he would take the historical profitability. Let's say that he first decided what returns he wanted to give his clients, and then from there, invented a portfolio that made sense with those returns. Of course, no one really wanted to know about it. After all, Madoff seemed to be achieving returns above even the market, and even more surprisingly, with very little variability, regardless of what the stock market did. To give you an idea, their investments suffered only five months of declines between 1993 and 2007, and the average real return throughout all of those years was 8%. And not only that, his investment firm, together with five other large companies, even founded the NASDAQ, the emblematic index of Wall Street's technological sector, of which he later became chairman for three years. Under his mandate, he attracted companies such as Apple, Sun Microsystem, Cisco, and Google. And later, he became a member of advisory committees for the SEC, the stock market regulator that was theoretically in charge of supervising and controlling their businesses. He was also a regular charity fundraiser and made significant contributions to the Democratic Party. In other words, he was clearly one of the great Wall Street kingpins. Everyone trusted Bernie Madoff, and even when someone dared to question his incredible returns, the American financier always came out on top. This was the case, for example, with financial analyst Harry Markopoulos, who collected evidence and time and time again proclaimed that Madoff's figures were simply impossible to obtain. He got hold of confidential documentation, tested the strategy, and even, with the help of quantitative analysts, demonstrated that there was no correlation between Madoff's profits and the performance of the S. S&P 100, thus filing a formal complaint with the SEC. But nothing came of it. Don't even think that this was an isolated event. The truth is that, starting in the 90s, the SEC regulators investigated the financial scheme that was actually a gigantic pyramid of up to five times. They never detected anything. Therefore, when everything came to light, there was general astonishment. 
And the consequences? Thousands of investors lost significant amounts of money. Madoff, who had managed to amass a personal fortune of $650 million, ended his days in a jail cell. And the SEC and US authorities took steps to tighten regulation. They even published the investors' decalogue. I'll leave it in the description in case you want to take a look at it. And there you have it. The story of one of the greatest frauds in the history of world finance. The greatest financial pyramid of all time, with apologies to some social security systems. But now, the question is over to you. How do you think such a pyramid scam could be set up without anyone knowing anything about it? Have you ever been promised safe, extraordinarily high, and constant returns over time? Please leave your comments below. And now, if you found this video interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe to Visual Politic. All the best. See you next time.